Well, Sarah, it is right at noon, so I think we'll go ahead and, and get started with our, our webinar here. I just did hit the uh, record button, so we're good that way for uh, recording. But I want to welcome everybody to our, our virtual Boots in the Barn webinar series. My name is Jen Bentley. I'm an Extension Dairy Field Specialist um, housed in Northeast Iowa. And so typically my, my Boots in the Barn program is um, actually out in the barn, right? So uh, we get to do some more hands-on things. Uh, but given everything going on this year, I decided to move it virtually, but still try to create some interaction here uh, during this webinar series. So I hope everybody enjoys this program. Um, you can see the, the list, the, the calendar dates that we have here coming up. So today's program, then followed by January 29th, we'll have Emily Kreckelberg, uh, who, who will be talking about a better farm, starts with a better you. And then February 5th, we're going to finish up with a panel of dairy women. So they're going to be sharing some of their tips and tricks and trades. And, and actually, I think they're going to be trying to take their cell phones out in the barn. So I, I think it'll be quite fun. So um, just a couple housekeeping things before we get started. Um, if you're joining us, if you could just mute your, your microphones at this point. Um, if you want to turn off your cameras during this uh, part of it. When we get to the Q&A session, you're more than welcome to uh, unmute yourself and ask a question that way. Or if you just want to type it in the chat box as you think about it through the webinar, go ahead and do that. And we'll address all those questions at the end. I will put in the the, the copy of the presentation here into the chat box. So you're able to download the presentation here today. And then also this will be recorded and archived on our Extension Dairy Team website. So you, if you wanna go back and review some things, you're more than welcome to. At the end of the program, I'm also going to put in an evaluation into the chat box and would appreciate uh, you clicking on that link. If you're not able to do at this point, I'm gonna also email it out to our audience and you can fill it out at, at a later time if you need to as well. So with that, Sarah, I'm gonna stop share my screen and while you're loading your presentation, uh, I'm gonna introduce you, okay? Um, so today, um, we have with us Dr. Sarah Adcock. Uh, she joined the department as an assistant professor of animal welfare at the University of Wisconsin in 2020. Her research includes evaluating how farm practices affect animal behavior, physiology, and productivity, and developing strategies to optimize these outcomes. Understanding the interconnections between animal welfare, socioeconomic, and environmental challenges on a local and global scale, a common goal of these research objectives is to achieve sustainable, socially responsible food production that benefits humans and animals alike. To this end, Sarah is interested in using interdisciplinary approaches that span the biological, social, and engineering sciences. So today she'll be discussing pain management for disbudding and steps producers can take to stay ahead of consumer, consumer concerns and the changing industry for this procedure. So with that, Sarah, I'll turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction. And I am unmuted, right? <laughs> Great. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate the, the invitation to be part of this program. And Really glad that everyone can make it out, and I hope that some of the information that I go over today will be useful for you. Um, so the uh, plan is to have about 45 minutes for slides, and then the remaining time is for discussion. And I would love to hear about what has been working for you and what isn't working for you with regards to disputing. Um, so with that, I'll see if I can advance the slide there. There you go. So the, the outline for the uh, slides is to begin by going over current practices for disputing and dehorning. So what is currently being done in the United States. And then I'll go into some considerations for best practice for this procedure based on what the science tells us. And then I'll wrap up by discussing uh, what kinds of changes we might expect to see for disputing in the future. So just to start, I want to distinguish between disputting and dehorning. So disputting refers to the procedure that's done before the horn attaches to the skull when the calf is less than eight weeks of age. And then after this time, the horn fuses with the skull in a more invasive procedure is required to remove it, which we refer to as dehorning. 
So I'm going to go over the what the current practices look like in the US right now, but I want to just pause here for a poll question and ask you what method you're currently using for dispatting. So are you using a hot iron, caustic paste, another method, or if you prefer not to answer, that is totally fine too. So I'm going to launch the poll here, Sarah, and you should see it on your screen there. And the audience would have the ability to select what method they use for disbudding. So I'll give them a little bit to, to answer that question here. Um, looks like we have about 11 participants and about 70% of us have chosen one. So I'll give another couple seconds yet here before I close it. And I'm gonna end the polling. I'll share these results, Sarah. So you should be able to see those. Uh, looks like we're split 50-50, hot iron or caustic paste. Yeah, okay, well, that's very, that's interesting. And um, so that's actually a little bit different than the the USDA survey, which um, was done, uh, the most recent one was back in 2014, which is amazingly seven years ago. So um, things have changed since then. Uh, what we're seeing right now is that the hot iron is the most common method used for disbudding. And over 94% of dairy producers in the US routinely disbud or dehorn their calves. And during that time, the use of caustic paste almost doubled from 9% to 16% of operations. And in the meantime, we saw a decrease in amputation methods like scoops, saws, and wires from 45 to 30%. So since that 2014 survey, things have definitely changed. Um, and we it's very likely, um, as the, the survey suggests, that we are seeing an increased use in caustic paste in recent years. Okay, so next I'd like to ask you um, what age you're disbudding at. So less than one week, uh, one to four weeks, four to eight weeks, or greater than eight weeks. All right, so I did just launch that, Sarah. So they should be able to see that uh, question, what age do you disbud at? Um, again, less than one week of age, one to four weeks of age, four to eight weeks of age, uh, older than eight weeks of age, or they prefer not to answer. So um, I'll give the audience a couple more seconds here to select their choices. Um, so we'll go ahead and I'll close that poll, Sarah, and I'll share those so you're able to see those. So um, I'll let you talk about the results there. Yeah, okay, great. So yeah, so we're seeing the majority are doing it around one to two months of age, and then no one's doing it above eight weeks of age. Um, and then a few that are doing it less than one week and uh, or in between one to four. So that actually, that agrees pretty well with the, the USDA survey, um, but probably slightly younger than what the, the survey recorded. So what we're seeing in the um, the most recent polls, or sorry, one sec. Uh, I'll go through this here. So what we've seen is that hot iron and caustic paste are occurring on average three to four days sooner than they were um, in 2007. So these are the data from 2014. Uh, so on average, producers are disputing with a hot iron at 7.1 weeks and using caustic paste at 2.3 weeks. So this, these ages are um, a little bit older for caustic paste than what is recommended. So on caustic paste, the uh, recommended age is to do it on calves that are less than one week of age. And with hot iron disbudding, it can be done up until the calves are eight weeks of age, after which time the horn attaches to the skull and you need more invasive methods. Um, like the, the saws, scoops, or wires. So all these procedures are painful and they do require some kind of pain management and we have been seeing increased uptake. Um, so before I, I go into those results, I'd like to ask you guys what pain management you're currently using in your practice. So give me a second here, Sarah, to launch that and... All right, so here, here is our, our next question. What pain management do you use? Our choices are none, a corneal nerve block like lidocaine, NSAID like meloxicam, a nerve block plus the NAC, NSAID, um, or prefer not to answer. So we'll give 
people a couple more seconds here to, to select those. And I'm gonna go ahead and end that polling, Sarah, and share those results to you. Okay, so we have the majority using an NSAID like naloxicam, um, and then about a third saying none, and then another 20% saying corneal nerve block. So that actually um, matches up fairly well. Um, we are, seen, I think, on average, more pain management use now than we were in the 2014 survey. So these are the, the results from the USDA survey. So we're seeing in 2007 with uh, hot iron that 14% of operations are using pain relief, and that doubled in 2014 to 30%. But for caustic paste, the, the use of pain relief is less common. So in 2014, it was uh, only 6% of operations that we're using pain relief for this method. And the, these surveys didn't uh, distinguish between the types of pain relief that were given. So uh, it's unclear if these were combinations of a corneal nerve block and NSAID or NSAID only or lidocaine only. So these changes that we've been seeing in dispending practices over the last decade are in part being driven by stakeholder attitudes. So, and this was a study from 2015 where Americans were given the chance to participate in a voluntary online survey. And of those that participated, 83% of producers and 92% of vets in the public thought that pain relief should be provided for disputing. So this tells us that pain management is an important concern for both industry stakeholders as well as consumers. And uh, as of last or two years ago now, the American Association of Bovine Practitioners recommends that pain management should be considered the standard of care for dehorning and dispending practices. So this means that vets agree that we have a responsibility to provide pain control for calves. And in response to these stakeholder concerns about pain uh, around dispending, we've seen some changes in quality assurance programs in the US. So in the most recent version of National Milk's Farm Program that went into effect last year, they've changed the standards for disputing. So now under their mandatory corrective action plan, calves must be disputed before eight weeks of age. And as part of their continuous improvement plan, pain mitigation is expected to be used when disputing calves for any method. And it's expected that the producer will work with their vet to determine an appropriate pain, med pain mitigation for disputing. So we can see that these disputing practices have changed over the last decade and they'll continue to change as the industry standards continue to evolve. So when we're talking about best practice, the questions that we need to ask include which methods should we use, what age should we do it at, and what kind of pain relief should we give? So we'll go through the evidence that we have for answering each of these questions. So to start with, which method should we use? So amputation methods like scoop dehorning are more painful and they cause more tissue damage and an increased risk of infection compared to disputing. So I won't be talking about dehorning since we have very clear evidence that it's not an appropriate method and since farm now requires that disputing is done under eight weeks of age, there's really no need for this procedure to be routinely done on farm. So the methods that I'll focus on are hot iron and caustic paste. And both of these methods work by causing a third degree burn that kills the horn growing tissue. So hot iron causes a thermal burn and caustic paste causes a chemical burn. And if you look at the structure of the skin, the outermost layer consists of a thin layer of epidermis. And below that we have the dermis, which contains the blood vessels and the nerve endings. And then below that we have a layer of fat. So in a first degree burn, just the epidermis is affected. In a second degree burn, the dermis is also damaged and then the skin will blister. And a third degree burn extends through all the layers and can reach down to the bone. So third degree is the most severe type of burn and it is very painful. So this pain associated with disputing is an important thing to con consider. 
So what do we know about the pain that's associated with each of these methods? There's been quite a few studies that have looked at hot iron dysphagia, so 44 in total. And then in contrast, we have uh, nine studies right now that have looked at pain from caustic paste dysphagia. So I'll start by going over the evidence for pain associated with hot iron dysphagia. So there have been several studies that have looked at the pain response in the immediate hours after hot iron dysphagia. And what we see is this increase in stress hormones like cortisol, heart rate goes up, and we see wound-directed behaviors like head shakes, head rubs, and ear flicks. And we also see a drop in play behavior. And these responses are reduced if we give the calf painkillers beforehand. So this tells us that the procedure is painful, but what about potentially longer-term pain that could be experienced during healing? So this is what my uh, PhD focused on, um, looking at these longer-term responses to hot iron dysphagia. So to, to first look at this question, we asked how long it takes the wounds to heal. And what we found is that it takes them nine weeks to heal on average. So what we see is that immediately after dysphagia, we have this copper ring of necrotic tissue. That necrotic tissue begins to peel away from the scalp about two weeks after dysphagia. By week three, that necrotic tissue has fallen off and it leaves an open wound. And then over the next four weeks, we see granulation tissue form in the wound bed, as well as a scab that forms over that tissue. And then by week nine, a new layer of skin, of skin has formed over the wound bed. And then that new skin will contract over the next few weeks until just a thin scar line is present and no horn grows from that tissue. So the next thing that we asked was whether these wounds are painful during this healing process. And there are two different kinds of pain that we can look at here. So the first is evoked pain, which is asking whether the wounds are painful when they're being touched. And then the second type of pain is ongoing pain, which is looking at whether those wounds are painful even when they're not being touched. So as an example, if you have a sunburn that is fairly mild, you might not find it painful unless it rubs up against something. So that would be an example of evoked pain. But if that sunburn is super severe, you would continue to feel that pain even when it's not being touched, uh, which would be an example of ongoing pain. So we first looked at whether these calves experience evoked pain during the healing period. This we used an odometer, which is a device that reads the force in mutants that's applied at the base of its tip. So we applied an increasing amount of pressure to the wound edge and then recorded the force when the calf moved away from that pressure. So if the wound is painful, a smaller amount of force is needed to elicit a response. So this is a video of what one of these algometer tests looked like. So the algometer here is reading the amount of force in mutants that's being applied at the base of the wound, and an increasing amount of force is applied, which you can see being read on the screen here, until a calf moves her head away. And then that maximum force is recorded. So the idea is that the more painful the wound is, the lower the amount of force that's needed to elicit a withdrawal response from the calf. So we found that the, the calves with wounds were more responsive to touch than when the tissue had healed. So this figure here is showing the amount of force at which a calf responded at each of these different healing stages. So lower amounts of force mean increased sensitivity. And just to give you an idea of what these forces represent, if you were to press a, a key on your laptop, you'd be using a force of about two newtons. So we're looking at very low levels of force here. Um, so when the damaged tissue is present, which is shown by these red bars, the calves are more sensitive than when the wounds have healed, which is shown by the blue bar. So this tells us that the wounds are painful when they're being touched during the healing period. And the next thing that we wanted to know was whether these wounds are painful even when they aren't being touched. So are the calves experiencing ongoing pain? And one way that we can look at that is through changes in their everyday behavior. So one behavior that we uh, thought would be affected by dysphagia was ruminating. So if you look at this calf ruminating here, you can see that there's a lot of jaw and ear movement, which could stimulate the wound. So we predicted that if the wounds are painful, the calves would ruminate less to avoid stimulating that wound. And that is what we saw. So we found that dysphagia calves ruminated less in the first two weeks after dysphagia compared to calves that were not dysphagia. 
We also said suckling since this behavior also involves a lot of head movement. And we predicted that the calves would suckle less to limit uh, head movement. And what we saw was actually the opposite. So the despotic calves suckled more than the calves that weren't despotic. And that effect lasted for at least three weeks after despotic, which was up until the end of our observation period. So what I think might be happening here is that suckling has a, a pain relieving effect. So in babies and in rat pups, we know that suckling can reduce pain. So the calves may actually be suckling more after despotting in order to receive that pain relieving effect. But we still need further research to, to look into that further. Another way that we can look at pain is to assess um, whether calves will seek out pain relief. So just like if you have a headache, you would take ibuprofen to feel better, calves experiencing pain may do something similar. So since we can't just give calves free access to drugs, alternatively, we can teach them to associate pain relief with something else in their environment. So in this study, we trained calves to associate an injection of lidocaine, um, so an analgesic, during the healing period. So this was at three weeks after disputing with the presentation of a black plywood board on the right side of their home pen. And you can see here, um, we attached a, a little a nipple to the board to increase their engagement with it. And then these calves also learned that a saline injection, so control, no pain relief, was associated with a uh, stripe board on the left side of their home pen. And what we predicted was that the disputed calves would spend more time with the board associated with lidocaine compared to the uh, uh, one that's associated with saline compared to calves that were not disputed. And that is what we found to be the case. So the disputed calves spent more time with the board associated with lidocaine compared uh, to calves that were not disputed. And this is a video of uh, one of these tests. So the calf here is given access to both boards. The black board she's learned to associate with pain relief and the striped board she's learned to associate with no pain relief. And uh, we looked at the, uh, which board they spent more time interacting with. So in this example, we see that the calf goes for the board that's associated with pain relief. And because the disputed calves are seeking out pain relief more than the calves aren't disputed, this is evidence that the calves are experiencing ongoing pain. And the, uh, three weeks after disputing. So overall, what we've learned about hot iron disputing is that the wounds take nine weeks to heal and they are painful during this time. Another method that we can uh, look at is caustic paste. And there's been a lot less research done on this method. So, so far there are nine studies that have looked at pain responses to disputing with caustic paste. So caustic paste has a, a high pH that works by liquefying the, the horn growing tissue. And it is um, usually easier to use than a hot iron, but there are some important considerations to keep in mind in order to use it successfully. So if it's not used properly, it can result in burns to other body parts. And the photo on the left here is an example of too much paste being applied. So all that's needed is an amount the size of a nickel. And uh, too much can also lead to excessive tissue damage and run off into the eyes or the face, uh, which you can see on the photo here in the right. And this photo is also an example of paste that's being applied way too late. Um, so it really should be used within those first few days after birth before the calf has figured out how to scratch her head. So it reduces the risk of the calf rubbing that paste onto other body parts. That's the nickel size amount. And then there's also some concerns about uh, paste in social housing. So if calves are group housed, there's a risk of that paste being transferred to other animals and causing tissue damage, which you can see in the uh, photo here. So to avoid paste transfer to uh, other body parts or animals, uh, all you need is a nickel sized amount that should be applied within the first week of life. It's also important to keep the calf dry for about 24 hours after the paste is applied to avoid it getting wet and running down the face. Um, and then the calf should also be isolated for 24 hours to avoid that paste transferring onto other animals. 
Um, and then I don't have uh, firsthand experience with this, but I have heard of people using duct tape to cover the horn bud um, as a way to reduce chances of the paste spreading onto other body parts or animals. So I'd also be interested to hear if anyone has experience with that, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on how it works. So looking at the, the evidence for pain after caustic paste disbudding, we see a response that's very similar to hot iron disbudding. So immediately afterwards, we see an increase in stress hormones like cortisol, heart rate goes up, and we see those wound-directed behaviors like head shakes, head rubs, and ear flicks. And then we also see a decrease in play, same as we saw with hot iron disbudding. And similarly, this response is reduced if we give painkillers. So what do we know about the healing process and potential longer-term pain from caustic paste disbudding? Uh, so we really don't have any research on this for calves. So in short, we just don't know. Um, anecdotally, the wounds take about six to 10 weeks to heal, which is comparable to using a hot iron. And there was a study in goat kids uh, that followed wounds up to six weeks after uh, caustic paste disbudding. And they found that these chemical burns were still present at six weeks and still quite large. Um, so it is important that we, we learn more about these potential longer-term effects of caustic paste. So overall, what we know about caustic paste is that it's painful for at least three hours, but the longer-term effects are just unknown at this point. So how does caustic paste compare to the hot iron method? There's also been very little research on this question. Um, so there was a survey of producers and vets in Ontario where they were asked to rank how painful they thought these procedures were on a scale from zero to 10. Zero being no pain and 10 being the worst pain possible. And both the producers and vets ranked the caustic paste as a 4.8, whereas they ranked the hot iron pain as a 6.7. So the caustic paste was perceived as less painful than hot iron. So this might explain why we see fewer operations using pain relief for caustic paste. We might also be seeing this higher use for hot iron disbudding because um, in this case, pain relief really benefits both the calf, but also the worker, since it makes the calf easier to handle and is safer for the person who's applying the iron. Whereas with caustic paste, that pain effect is more delayed so it has that perception of being less painful and it's also easier to apply. So the pain relief doesn't provide that same benefit for handling. Um, so in this case, the, for caustic paste, pain relief is really um, for the benefit of the calf. And if we look at what the, the science says on this matter, so hot iron versus caustic paste, there are only two studies that have actually compared the two. The first was done in 1995, and they found that calves that were disbudded with a hot iron had a lower stress response than calves disbudded with caustic paste. But they did these procedures at different ages, so it makes it difficult to compare um, stress responses since the age may be playing a role. And then the other study was from 2005, and they found that calves disbudded with a hot iron shook their head more in the first four hours compared to calves disbudded with paste. So they concluded from this that caustic paste was less painful. So based on these two studies, which have conflicting results, we can't say at this point which is less painful. Um, so we just need more research to compare these methods. So to answer the question, which method should we use? Uh, based on the evidence that we have so far, we can say that both hot iron and caustic paste are appropriate methods as long as the proper protocol is followed. So what age should we disbud at? So as a reminder, we should be disbudding before eight weeks of age to avoid the need for more invasive dehorning procedures. And this is also mandated by the farm program. For caustic paste, this should be done within the first few days after birth before the calf is able to scratch her head. And then hot iron disbudding can be done as soon as the bud is visible, so within a couple of days after birth, up until the horn attaches to the skull around eight weeks of age. So we know that we need to disbud under eight weeks, but within this zero to eight week window, is there any evidence that doing it younger is better? 
So should we, do, should we be doing it immediately after birth? So it is widely believed that newborns feel less, plain, less pain, but there is no actual uh, scientific support for this claim. And this assumption isn't just about farm animals, but the, the question of whether human babies can experience pain um, has been a source of immense controversy in the medical community as well. So in 2009, 60% um, of babies did not receive any pain relief during painful procedures. And that's troubling because it shows that babies feel pain in the same way that adults do. So this was a study from a few years ago that scanned the brains of babies during painful procedures, and they found that they light up in all the same areas as they do for adults that feel pain. So fortunately, this is changing and babies are receiving more pain medication now. And this issue of newborn pain has also received more attention in farm animals. So there have been a few studies that have compared hot iron disputting in calves less than a week of age to calves that are four weeks or older. And in all of these studies, they found that pain, the pain response is similar across age groups. So calves experience pain no matter how young they are. And this tells us that we need to provide pain control for all ages. There's also some evidence in other species that painful experiences near birth can increase your sensitivity to pain as an adult. So lambs that were castrated at one day of age have a greater pain response to tail docking later in life than lambs that were castrated at 10 days of age. And then rats that experience pain near birth are also more sensitive to pain as adults compared to rats that had no early life pain experience. And we see uh, something similar with babies where uh, circumcised babies show a stronger pain response to a vaccination as toddlers than uncircumcised babies. There are also some other factors besides pain that we should um, consider when we're deciding what age to disbud at. So if we disbud within the first few days after birth, we risk disbudding calves before we can be confident that they have horns. Um, so it's not with pulled animals, it's not always obvious whether or not they have horns until a few weeks of age. So if you're using pulled sires, it might be wise to disbud at a later age rather than just disbudding everyone at a very young age if your goal is to increase the number of pulled animals in your herd. And then another factor to consider is the risk of scurs. So if you're disbudding newborns, um, when it can sometimes be a little bit difficult to tell where the horn bud is, it's important to, to clip the hair um, to be able to really identify the bud. And this should be done by someone who is uh, skilled at locating the bud. So for answering this question, what age should we just bud at? For sure, we should be doing it before eight weeks of age, but there is no evidence that disbudding near birth is better for welfare. So at the moment, any time between zero to eight weeks um, is, it, yeah, we, we don't really have any evidence that within that time window that a certain age is better, except with the exception that cost of pace should be done within the first, the first few days. Okay, so we've gone through the, the evidence that shows that disbutting is painful, no matter the method or the age that it's done at. So what type of pain relief should we give? So numbing the horn bud with a local anesthetic is really important. Um, so this is done by giving a corneal nerve block about 10 minutes before disbudding. And this will numb the horn bud for about two to three hours. It's also uh, recommended to give a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or NSAID for short to reduce the inflammatory pain in the hours after disbudding. And the studies that have looked at these um, pain management uh, protocols have found that a combination of local anesthetic and an NSAID is the most effective one for reducing pain for both hot iron and caustic paste methods. There have been a few studies that have looked at uh, topical anesthesia, so numbing cream or gel, and none of these have found that it's an effective substitute for corneal nerve block. So I'll go through the uh, steps for giving a, a corneal nerve block. So you'll need a, a prescription for 2% methane hydrochloride, as well as 20 gauge one inch needles and a 12 milliliter syringe for drying out the lidocaine. 
So a nerve block consists of five milliliters of lidocaine on each side of the head. So you begin by drying up 10 milliliters of lidocaine in the syringe. And then to give the injection, you can restrain the calf either manually or with a head restraint or a halter. And to locate the injection site, there's a bony ridge that runs between the eye and the horn bud. And so under this ridge is the corneal nerve, which supplies sensation to the horn bud. And if you feel below that ridge, you'll feel a slight depression just behind the corner of the eye. And that's the spot where you want to insert the needle. And then when you insert the needle, you aim it towards the horn bud at a 45 degree angle to the skin and you insert the needle all the way up to his hub. And it should go in super smoothly. If you hit bone, you can readjust the needle, but it should be able to go in um, all the way up to the hub without any resistance. And then uh, you can inject the five milliliters of lidocaine using a, a bit of a, a slow fanning motion and then inject the remaining five milliliters on the other side. So the lidocaine takes about five to 10 minutes to numb the horn bud, and then it will remain effective for two to three hours. So this means that you can go through all your calves and give them the nerve block first, and then come back and dispud them all to save a bit of time. So after at least uh, 10 minutes have passed, you can trim the hair around the horn bud to make it easier to locate the bud, especially on the younger calves. And then we can check to make sure the block worked by using a pinprick, a pinprick test. So to do this, you can use the needle um, on your syringe to lightly prick around the base of the horn bud. And if the calf responds by moving her head or flicking her ear, uh, you'd give another two milliliters of lidocaine on that side and wait five minutes before testing again. So in addition to the, the local anesthetic or the uh, corneal nerve block, it's also strongly recommended to give an NSAID before disputting. So this will help with the inflammation and the hours after the procedure. So there are a few different NSAIDs that have been looked at for disputting, and they all vary in how long their effect lasts. So the shortest acting is ketoprofen, which has a half-life of less than half an hour. Um, and it can be given either IV or intramuscularly. And then flunixin, uh, when given IV, has a half-life of three to eight hours. Meloxicam can be given either IV, subcutane subcutaneously, or orally, and that has a half-life of 27 hours. And then carprofen can be given uh, either IV or subcutaneously and has a half-life of 50 hours. So the size of these uh, circles represents the number of studies that have found that the NSAID reduces pain from disputting. So there's been one study that has demonstrated a benefit of flunixin or carprofen, three that have shown a benefit for ketoprofen, and five that have shown a, a benefit for meloxicam. So of these NSAIDs, only flunixin, or you might also know it by its brand name, Banamine, um, is FDA approved for cattle. Uh, it's approved for intravenous use to, to treat fever from BRD, but it can also be prescribed for extra label use as an analgesic. Um, so under the, the Animal Medicinal Drug Use Clarification Act, or MDUCA, vets can prescribe drugs in a manner that's not specified on the label under certain conditions. So um, this is what uh, extra label refers to. And then transdermal banamine was recently approved for treating pain from foot rot. So this is a pour-on solution that is really easy to administer, but only one study so far has actually looked at it for disputting, and they found that it wasn't effective for controlling pain when it's given on its own. So it's possible that it might help if it was given in combination with a nerve block, but that, wasn't, uh, that hasn't been tested so far. So based on all the evidence that we currently have, meloxicam is the NSAID of choice for disputting since it has a number of benefits. So it's longer acting than flunixin. It's easy to administer when it's given as oral tablets. And it has been shown in several studies to reduce pain. 
and it can also be prescribed for extra label use by your vet. Um, and it, this can be given while you're waiting for the lidocaine to take effect. So to give oral meloxicam, you would need a prescription from your vet, um, a gelatin capsule, and then a balling gun. And the first step would be to calculate the number of tablets you need for a one milligram per kilogram dose, and then add those tablets to the gelatin capsule. And still in the balling gun. And then straddle the calf, and I use the fingers to guide the balling gun down the center of the calf's throat, push the plunger to release the capsule, and then just ch check to make sure that the capsule is swallowed. We can also give a sedative, um, so like xylazine, but, um, and this can reduce handling stress for the calf and the worker but it doesn't provide any substantial pain relief. So it should always be combined with a nerve block and an NSAID. So this is a video of uh, dispiting of a hot iron. Uh, so this iron here has been heated up to about 450 degrees and I'll check the temperature of the iron with a, a temperature gun to make sure it's hot enough. And then I apply it for about 10 to 15 seconds into uniform copper ring forms. Um, and then optionally, you can choose to, to flick out that bud afterwards. Um, and there hasn't been any research looking at the advantages to leaving the bud in or flicking it out, um, but both seem to be pretty effective. So it's really a matter of preference um, since we don't have any, any research on recommendations for that at the moment. So to answer that question, what pain relief should we give? A corneal nerve block and meloxicam is currently the best practice. And we can also optionally give a sedative that would improve the handling ease. So this combination of a block and meloxicam is only effective at managing pain for the first day after disputting. And we currently don't have any practical ways to control longer term pain that occurs during the healing period. And if that longer term pain isn't addressed, it could contribute to this negative public perception about disputting. And if consumer acceptance for disputting continues to decrease, then increased value would be placed on less painful alternatives. So there have been a couple alternative methods that have been looked at for disputting. One method that seemed promising initially was to inject clove oil under the horn bed. But unfortunately, 67% of 67% uh, of horns or scurs grow after using this method. And then another alternative that was looked at is cryosurgery, which is um, involves spraying liquid nitrogen directly onto the horn bud. But this was shown to be 100% ineffective. Um, so these methods at the moment don't seem to be viable alternatives, at least as they're currently being used. Breeding pulled animals would avoid the need for disputting. So hornlessness is a dominant trait that is naturally occurring in cattle, but is only present at a very low frequency in our dairy breeds. And in contrast, 88% uh, of beef cattle in the US are pulled. So we can selectively breed for pulled animals by using sires that carry the pulled gene. And pulled genetics is uh, gaining popularity in the dairy industry. Uh, but it's still a niche market due to the risk of increased inbreeding and then uh, as well as slower genetic improvement because these pulled sires are still rare. Uh, but the number of pulled sires is growing, so that gap in genetic merit between horned and pulled animals is shrinking. So as these uh, concerns about disputing increase, we can expect to see growing demand to incorporate pulled genetics into the herd. So animal health organizations like the ABMA and the World Organization for Animal Health recommend breeding for pulled cattle whenever possible. Uh, so in the US, uh, some of the nation's largest dairy pro processors and retailers are encouraging suppliers to integrate more pulled cattle into their herds. So pulled genetics isn't currently being enforced in any way, but it is definitely something to keep on your radar um, and encourage uh, farmers to select for if possible.
An alternative to uh, using traditional breeding for pulled cattle is to use gene editing. So this is a tool that allows us to directly introduce the pulled gene into the genome by changing the animal's genetic code. So this would allow us to introduce the pulled gene into the genome of elite sires, and they would then pass that trait onto their offspring. So this is being successfully done, and this is a photo of a naturally pulled offspring from a gene edited bull. So these gene editing technologies could rapidly increase the number of pulled animals while also maintaining the, the rate of genetic gain and constraining and breeding. And uh, consumer acceptance will be important for this to be a viable option. But there was a, a recent poll that showed that the majority of Americans uh, support gene editing for hornless cattle. But it's still unclear how gene editing will be handled by the federal government since gene edited animals are not commercially available yet. So it still needs to receive regulatory approval before this could be an option. So to wrap up, the, the take home points uh, are that disbunding is painful regardless of the method and age of the calf. It should be done before eight weeks of age to avoid the need for more invasive procedures. And best practice is uh, to give a corneal nerve block and an NSAID before disbudding. And this is true for both hot iron and caustic paste and no matter how young the calf is. And then if social acceptance for disbudding continues to decrease, we can expect to see an increase in the value of pooled animals. So it is a good idea to incorporate pool genetics into your herd whenever possible. Um, so I just wanna mention here that we, um, in collaboration with the, the UC Davis College of Ag and Environmental Sciences, we put out a, a YouTube video that covers some of the steps that I talked about today. So that's um, available in both English and Spanish online. Um, so yeah, so I, be happy to take questions now, and uh, you can also feel free to email me if you have any questions that come up at a later point. Thank you. Well, thanks, Dr. Adcock, for this great presentation. You've created a lot of visual visuals and videos that uh, made us feel like we were still out in the barn today. So I appreciate that. Um, a lot of good good demonstrations there. Um, as we take questions, I do see some in the in the chat box here. So we'll go through those first. Um, one question is we dissolve our meloxicam in the milk that we feed a few hours prior to applying paste. Is this an effective way to administer the meloxicam? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So there uh, haven't, to my knowledge, that hasn't been looked at. Um, but that is certainly, I would imagine that it still is an effective way to administer it. Um, and I think it's also, it has that advantage of being impractical and um, a little time saving too. So I, I can't say that we know for certain if how that compares to giving those oral tablets directly. Um, it's likely not as uh, strong of an effect, but I think it also depends on the dose that you're giving it at. Um, and what has been looked at in the literature for in terms of dosage is both 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram and one milligrams per kilogram. So I think if, you know, if you're giving that the higher dosage of one milligram, um, I, I think that that is an effective way to do it. All right, and then our next question, do you have any suggestions for timing of feeding milk and disbudding? So before or after, is there any best, best protocol for that? Uh, so that's actually something that we're looking into at the moment um, in terms of whether the, the providing that milk could actually be a form of analgesic. Um, so if it is, then I would, um, you know, suggest that maybe giving the milk immediately before disputing could um, actually alleviate some of that pain. But uh, I don't have research to back that up right now, but that's something that we're looking into. Yeah. And that's a good point. I just thinking about that for a question as far as group housing. So if those calves are dehorned, do they go up to that auto feeder? Um, you know, just because of that suckling, that video that you showed made it seem like calves suckle more after the spudding. So do you see that as an, as an issue in group housed calves? 
Yeah, it's a, another good point. So one of the things that we saw in that study where we, we saw the, the increase in suckling was actually that that effect was delayed. So we didn't see an increase in the first couple of days after disbudding. It only started happening about three days after disbudding. And then stayed at that increase in suckling was consistently higher um, for at least three weeks. But we didn't see it immediately after. So my the sense what what one idea of what could be happening there is that they're actually learning over time that by suckling they're able to lose the pain. So it's not an immediate um, immediate response. It's something that's learned um, over at least a few days. But I think longer term, yeah, like looking at that, um, you know, the potential side effects of that increased desire to suckle would be something that would be good to look at. And I, yeah, again, can't say that we have looked at that yet, but sure. I think it's a, a valid concern. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And we have another question that came into the chat box. Um, should we be considering a second dose of moxicam at like day three or apply or at like day three after applying paste, or would this be too big of a risk for stomach upset? I, so I, I think a couple um, giving uh, multiple dosages, as long as it's not, I think twice is not um, an issue. I think it's more of an issue when it's given for continuous for, for weeks. Um, so I, I don't think there's any issue of giving a second dose. Um, I think that's actually a beneficial thing to do for the calf and I would recommend that, yeah. The, the question is just how many doses could we give um, and that I don't have a specific answer, but for sure two is okay. Great, and if you have any other questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box or, you know, we are a small enough group. If you feel comfortable, you can go ahead and unmute your mic and, and ask a question as well. So uh, we'll give you a couple minutes to do that. My other question was going back to that, um, rumination of the calves, you know, it was associated with less ruminating. Did you see decreased uh, weight gain during that time as well if the calves aren't ruminating? No, so we haven't seen any effect on weight gain. Um, and that's pretty consistent across papers on this budding that there is um, really no strong effect on either, um, I mean, I guess, most of these studies have compared um, calves that were despite with pain relief to calves that are not despite with pain relief. So the actual difference between calves that are, um, you know, despite versus not despite at all hasn't been looked at. Uh, but in terms of pain relief, there really hasn't been any benefit shown for weight gain. Um, it's just a, it's a pretty crude measure of pain, um, pain responses. So it doesn't often show up as a, an effect um, with these pain management studies. So the, the benefits for pain management are more in terms of the, the welfare and the social acceptance and the, the productivity changes because we don't seem to see much happening there. Okay, good. And uh, go ahead and put any more questions in the chat while I'm, while I'm waiting for that. I'm just gonna um, share my screen, Sarah and, um, get to our closing slide here, kind of some ending points here. Uh, let's, I'm gonna pull my chat box back up, see if there's anything else in here. Um, just any final comments. Um, I, would, I did put in the Qualtrics evaluation for today's program. So uh, after today, please go ahead and click on that link and that'll help us evaluate our programs that we're doing, um, help us drive our, our educational programs. So, uh, would appreciate you taking some time to do that. Again, if you can't do that right now, I will send that in an email and you can do it at a, at a later date as well. Um, we did have one comment come back in here that you mentioned duct tape earlier. Uh, we do actually put a small piece on each horn after applying the paste and it stays on for about two days and seems to keep the paste in place. We've never had one with any strange burns. So, and I would say I've seen some of my producers in my area use the duct tape as well. And it seems like it, it stays for, you know, that two days after about two days, it kind of goes off or the calf starts rubbing and itching. So then it eventually falls off. Okay. That, yeah, that's great to hear it. From what I've heard so far, it does seem like it's, it works pretty well. So 
that's something I'll, I'll keep in mind too. Okay. Great. Well, Dr. Sarah Adcock, I appreciate you being on our webinar here today. Great information and some really uh, great visuals to help us as we make those decisions um, on the care of our calves. And, you know, that's always a controversial topic when we get into just budding and how can we do that in a way that we're relieving that pain for that calf, but also doing the right thing for our, for our uh, dairy farm as well. Um, so kind of in conclusion today, just some things for, you know, as you're participating in the chat box, I did put in the PDF of the webinar. So if you want to download, you know, a PDF copy of those slides, you certainly can do that. Um, otherwise, I will be putting this recorded art recorded webinar onto our extension dairy team websites under our webinars section. Um, and just a reminder, we do have another program coming up next Friday at noon again with um, Emily Kreckelberg. She's a farm safety and health extension educator at the University of Minnesota. And we're going to be interacting with the group about wellness, self-care, and strategies to help yourself and others cope with stress. Um, so I know Emily will keep it interactive and, and she's a really a um, great educator in delivering that message. So um, with that, if I don't see any other questions or anything, any last comments from anybody? I'm gonna stop share. I don't see any comments in the chat box. So again, thanks for being on and hope to see everybody next week. And thanks so much for having me. Bye.